Looks to me like we're ready to start. Hi, I'm Claudia Rosette, and I have the pleasure of moderating this impressive panel. Um, the, uh, the credentials of our panelists are too numerous for me to go through. They're all in your program. I'm just going to name one thing that jumped out at me about each of them. Uh, the first one is that Dr. Michael Green, who is a black belt swordsman and plays the bagpipes. <laughs> Johan van der Ven, who is officially, and I stress officially, a rising star. And Admiral McDevitt, who has had four commands at sea in the Pacific, including an aircraft carrier group. And with that, why don't we start with you? Uh, th thank you, Claudia. Can you all hear me? <clears throat> it's great to be uh, here at the Jamestown Foundation. Um, I always defer to Admiral McDevitt because even the most skilled swordsman is no match for a carrier battle group, um, even when bagpipes are on the side of the swordsman. Um, it, uh, it really is um, uh, great to, to be here. I, I, I learn a lot from Jamestown Foundation. I enjoy the, um, the group that uh, Glenn brings together. I'm meeting him in two or three weeks, the young rising stars, um, strategic thinkers. Uh, it's a great contribution to the debate. <clears throat> the topic um, is uh, grand strategy, <clears throat> which... Um, could be almost anything really, but um, I thought I'd focus on um, how I think we should be thinking about um, our China strategy on the larger um, chessboard of, of the Indo-Pacific. Um, uh, I have a podcast, by the way, CSIS.org, called the Asia Chessboard, which tries to um, have discussions with senior officials, senior former senior officials, on this larger chess game with China. Um, the next one is with uh, my former boss, former National Security Advisor, Steve Hadley. <clears throat> and in the discussion, we try to um, maintain the discipline of thinking about the region as a whole. Uh, because all too often in recent years, U.S. strategy has um, narrowed in on the bilateral relationship with China in an either adversarial way or in an um, uh, accommodating way. So the Obama administration, even during and after the pivot to Asia, uh, was obsessed with this proposal from Xi Jinping for a new model of great power relations, which was essentially a, a bipolar condominium where the U.S. and China would avoid the so-called Thucydides trap um, by um, uh, resolving issues. But in the Chinese version of this, that meant backing away from the Taiwan Relations Act, backing away from commitments to Japan over the Senkakus, uh, to the Philippines, and to other traditional allies and partners. And so it was a kind of... Uh, uh, if any of you have kids and they join the soccer team in fourth grade, I have two who played soccer in fourth grade, you know, the coach tells them, okay, here's, here's your position, and as soon as the whistle blows, they all run after the ball. So this was a classic case of people looking at the China problem, saying we have a problem, and then running after the ball and saying we'll solve it by uh, reaching some kind of grand strategic bargain, um, which is a loser for the U.S. Uh, with China and especially for U.S. allies and partners. In some ways, the current administration is a little bit guilty of the same thing on the, on the other side of the coin, which is focusing too much in strategic competition on ensuring that others compete with China the way we do. Um, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has been a little bit too John Foster Dulles in his speeches in recent months in calling for um, allies and partners to essentially uh, choose us, not China. And if you think about this as a competition with China with many dimensions, but one of the most important dimensions will be alignment within Asia, um, we do not want to be going into the region saying you're with us or you're against us. Um, so it really requires a focus on, on the region as a whole, um, as uh, Rich Armitage and Joe Nye and a number of us wrote in a report about 10 years ago, to get China right, you've got to get Asia right. Um, and a, U.S. strategy that has leverage and has um, impact is going to be one where we are as aligned as we can be with the rest of the region, recognizing, and I thought Randy Shriver's comments reflected this kind of thinking, that there are going to be different flavors and there are going to be different temperatures across the region for how countries compete with China. But make no mistake, every country is competing with China, but the way they're doing it is very, very different. Um, China is also, of course, targeting the region. Um, Beijing uh, recognizes full well that the center of gravity for American forward presence and influence in the region rests on our alliances and partnerships. And Beijing has, in, has been targeting those alliances and partnerships um, with increasing um, 
boldness over the last decade. Um, about a decade ago, the Central Military Commission uh, promulgated the Near Sea Strategy, or the Near Sea Doctrine, with uh, then Vice Chairman Xi Jinping overseeing the effort. And it's what we all know quite well, which was the desire or the goal to uh, deny access to the first island chain and uh, contest the silent second island chain, and then move to control over the first island chain waters, um, deny the second island chain, contest beyond Guam. Um, that um, strategy, I think, uh, has been pursued with increasing um, uh, risk tolerance by Beijing. I think China's been willing to take on the geopolitical blowback and risks that come with that strategy. Um, in 2014, Xi Jinping's speech in Shanghai at the Sika Conference of Eurasian Powers um, explicitly stated, as many of you know, that uh, Asians should uh, secure themselves without the help of outside blocs, which was an explicit attack on the US alliance network in very similar language to uh, that chosen by uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in 1986 when he was trying to weaken and break up US alliances uh, when he gave a speech calling for a kind of Asianism and Asian multilateralism without alliances um, in the midst of the Cold War. And the Chinese uh, efforts at coercion against allies have been quite uh, bold. Um, uh, on the Korean Peninsula, the boycott of Lotte and other companies to the tune of billions of dollars because of Korea's decision to, to accept a US missile defense system, the terminal high altitude air defense, that system, which China views as a threat, not because uh, Thad can somehow target China, but because Beijing knew full well, full well that an integrated missile defense among America's bilateral security alliances would begin to create the kind of collective security capabilities that would constrain China's freedom of action. Um, and then, of course, as uh, Assistant Secretary Shriver said, in the South China Sea, after promising in the Rose Garden that he would not militarize these artificial islands, Xi Jinping then proceeded to militarize uh, the islands. And the um, uh, targeting of US alliances has expanded both geographically and in domain beyond that. Um, you have, in addition to the island building, um, the um, move into the South Pacific, uh, which I hope we'll talk about a little bit on this panel. And uh, today, a prominent uh, politician from the region raised concerns uh, that Beijing, having switched relations from uh, the Republic of China, from Taiwan, uh, sorry, that Solomon Islands, having switched relations to uh, Beijing, is now talking about major investment of a dual-use military nature, which a lot of us could see uh, coming. Um, or the use of um, Belt and Road Initiative to build dual-use military infrastructure across the Pacific, or as Randy said earlier, uh, the increasing Chinese um, uh, military interest in the Arctic. This is both a reflection of Chinese blue water, ice water, geopolitical ambitions, uh, but it's also uh, a very effective strategy to stretch the U.S. past the first island chain, past the defense of Taiwan, past the defense of Taiwan, to complicate planning for our friends, partners, and allies. Um, Australia has no explicit commitment in the defense uh, or to the defense of Taiwan, but a use of military force by the PLA would very likely um, bring about an Australian response of some kind. Um, unless Chinese submarines are operating out of Vanuatu or the Solomon Islands, in which case the Royal Australian Navy has got to tend its right flank. Um, the Indian Ocean will be critical for any crisis in the East China Sea. The Fifth Fleet will want to transit the Indian Ocean very potentially, unless there are PLA submarines um, loitering in uh, Chakpao or in um, other dual-use uh, military facilities from Djibouti uh, all the way to the um, East China Sea. So um, this is a question um, across the domains from peacetime influence to um, crisis and high-end war fighting. Is China's strategy of targeting allies and partners playing the chessboard uh, fully, not just uh, directly at the US, working? Um, no and yes. Um, I do not think it is working with the major democratic allies and partners in the region. Um, Japan in 2013 in its first national security strategy premised its, its entire foreign policy strategy on competing with China. And the more recent national defense program guidelines and midterm defense plan is also clearly aimed at increasing capabilities uh, to deal with Chinese gray zone coercion and military threats and to align more closely with the US, Australia, and others. Australia in its 2017 white paper focused very specifically on coercion by China. New Zealand followed in 2018. In March of this year, the Europeans, after an awful lot of um, waffling, 
decades of waffling about China, came out with a very strong statement uh, in the EU um, uh, strategic vision on China, which, which described Europe and China as being embarked on a systemic level competition. Um, and then things that 10 years ago were considered too, too risky in terms of China's response, like the Quad, uh, are, now, are now underway. Korea is more of a mixed bag. The Korean Peninsula, I think, uh, we need to recognize historically has been um, uh, the cockpit of Asia, the place where big powers vie for control and dominance of Northeast Asia. It's why Japan fought Russia, Japan fought China, and ultimately why we fought Japan, was who would control the Korean Peninsula, Manchuria, um, and that access point between Japan, China, and Russia. Uh, I don't worry too much about the Korean people. In a recent uh, public opinion poll, Koreans were asked, um, whose side are you on in the U.S.-China strategic competition? 75% of Koreans said on the U.S. side. And then the survey uh, asked, what if that intensifies and becomes a full-blown trade war? And then 67% said on the U.S. side. But I do worry that the U.S. and the current Korean government are signaling to China that Korea is in play. Um, when the President of the United States stands next to the leader of North Korea in Singapore and says, someday I would like to pull U.S. troops out of Korea, that's not a good sign of long-term U.S. strategic commitment uh, to this really critical um, arena of great power competition. Southeast Asia is very much a mixed bag. It's an absolute requirement at every conference on Asian security that you quote Henry Kissinger saying, Southeast Asians don't want to choose. There, I've done it. Check the box. In case you don't know, Southeast Asians don't want to choose uh, between the U.S. and China. Um, in my view, no uh, member of ASEAN, uh, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, has chosen. Um, you know, at one end, now you have uh, Mahathir, who's come back to power on a essentially anti-China campaign, promising to pull out of Belt and Road initiatives. But then what did Mahathir do? He used that to go back in and renegotiate uh, the um, jungle city that Chinese were going to build uh, at less than half the price that Chinese were originally offering without all the debt traps. Um, on the other hand, you have Cambodia, which, um, at least in terms of diplomacy, looks to be almost entirely in Beijing's pocket. But uh, opinion polls uh, in Cambodia show that young Cambodians are very pro-US, well over 80%. Um, and in a similar way, uh, Japan is the most popular country in Southeast Asia in opinion polling by a very wide margin. When we've done surveys at CSIS about the future of norms in Asia, um, overwhelmingly, uh, the response chosen by elites in this poll is that democracy, governance, rule of law, human rights are the norms that should govern Asia in the future, not uh, some kind of um, one, one country, two systems, or um, common destiny under the Belt and Road. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that Southeast Asia will avoid choosing, so it's an ongoing contest. And what we can do best there is make sure that um, we are on the side of sovereignty and uh, national resilience, that we make it possible through transparency, through some uh, infrastructure lending, um, through active diplomacy and partnerships with big partners like India and Japan and Australia, we make it possible for these countries to choose without coercion from China. That, that's something they will choose is making their own choices, and we can help. Um, so that's kind of how I see the state of play. It's very much in flux. flux. We've had some good moves. I think the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy is a framework that is enduring and reflects our real interests much better than the new model of great power relations or some kind of bipolar condominium with China. Uh, yes, it was invented in Japan. My classmate from SAIS, Suzuki-san, wrote the document in the foreign ministry, which he then lent to the Secretary of State. Rex Tillerson for his speech at CSIS, but it doesn't matter. The fact that the strategy was written in Japan and we don't care is a really good signal to China. Uh, we, we're proud to have the Japanese ownership and the Australians and to some extent the Indians on board. So the free and open Indo-Pacific is a good framing, but we have some, as you would be well aware, some very, very large um, self-inflicted wounds from TPP to our trade war uh, with everyone, uh, a little bit less with Japan now with this small deal to our inconsistency on democracy and values and human rights. And even you know, when you do regional strategy, one thing you realize is events on the other side of the world are interpreted in your region. And the current problem with Syria is not good for us in Asia. Uh, number one, it's incredibly distracting. And number two, it raises questions about American commitment. Even though people like me will point out again and again, a security treaty with Japan or Korea, the Taiwan Relations Act, a law, um, uh, in, in, you know, in, in implemented for decades is quite a bit different from the situation in Syria. But nevertheless, uh, that also goes on the list of ways we're hurting 
our strategy. Um, although, as I said, I think the free and open Indo-Pacific is a framing that I hope we continue into the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now we go to the role of, belt, of the Belt and Road in PRC foreign policy. Um, thank you to Claudia for uh, moderating, and thank you to John for inviting me. So I'll be talking to you today about the Belt and Road and what it will tell us about Chinese policymaking. So, so far it is clear um, that the BRI is a centerpiece of Xi Jinping's foreign policy. That much is clear from its integration into China's party constitution at the 19th uh, Party Congress in 2017. Other signs of that priority include the ongoing build-out of the national leading small group for deepening the implementation of BRI, as well as the importance given to uh, securing support from foreign leaders during interactions on Xi Jinping's foreign visits. However, I will argue to you today that there are signs that we must pay attention to that BRI is also a bottom-up initiative uh, driven by competitive appeasement among Chinese government bureaucracies, provincial authorities, and companies, both private and state-owned, and foreign and domestic. And this uh, competitive appeasement is, has played a crucial ro role so far in kickstarting investment, but it has also had strong negative externalities. Um, and because of these negative externalities, there are signs as well that the central government is right now seeking to reassert its authority and control over BRI. The best signs for this competitive appeasement and bottom-up process come from the, pre the prefixing of the BRI label to events and initiatives with no direct uh, connection to the core substance of BRI, which is, which is namely building railways, building airports, building ports in developing countries. These examples include things such as the BRI Heiko Youth Football Tournament in 2017, the BRI Colorful Yunnan International Football Tournament in 2018, the BRI International Basketball Tournament in 2018, and as another example, the BRI China Hunan International Chess Open. And it isn't just Chinese entities that are organizing these things. For, for example, Standard Chartered Bank organized the One Belt, One Road, One Relay event. Um, so there is a strong example there of uh, BRI becoming something that is tacked on to seemingly random events. And it's not just in the sporting sector either. For instance, uh, this January, we saw the BRI International Fashion Expo in Xi'an. We saw a music festival tagged with the BRI name in Shenzhen. And we also saw a Belt and Road Gourmet Kitchen at a uh, cooking event in Hong Kong. And these seem like random events, but I do believe that they offer us insight. Some analysts have said that these things show that Belt and Road is everything and nothing. I argue instead that it provides a window into the bureaucrat bureaucratic backdrop to BRI. Namely, it shows us that BRI is not necessarily a carefully marshaled, carefully controlled initiative, but is instead driven by various entities seeking support from the Chinese government. And, and as I've just said, this includes foreign entities, including Standard Chartered. I would add that um, it's, whereas sporting events are perhaps um, a distraction from, from what BRI seeks to achieve, this competitive appeasement has um, led to some important gains. Um, from entities that you would expect to be, to be involved in building power plants and airports and so on. Uh, for instance, Standard Chartered went beyond the One Belt, One Road, One Relay. Um, in 2017, they announced that they aimed to invest $20 billion in investment in BRI projects by 2020. Um, General Electric announced a joint uh, energy fund with China's Silk Road Fund. Deutsche Bank signed a $3 billion cooperation agreement with China Development Bank. So if uh, BRI football events are the negative externalities, these can be thought of as the intended outcomes of competitive appeasement under BRI. Nonetheless, these negative externalities do show us not only the importance of competitive appeasement under BRI, it also shows us how clear it is that there is a lack of a tight definition of what BRI actually is. And this lack of tight definition allows all comers, 
not just en engineering firms, not just banks, to seek to accrue political capital from the BRI. Um, and that is why we have football tournaments in Kunming or chess events in Hunan. What does that mean, though? Does BRI sporting events mean that BRI is a failure? I argue that's not the case. Instead, um, that this type of gray zone policymaking is not uncommon in Chinese governance. Indeed, gestating a loosely defined policy and letting competitive appeasement take over has a precedent. Just one example is the case of internet service providers that have been made legally liable for the content on their platforms but without any clear guideline as to what will actually get them in trouble. And with regards to BRI, this is clearly an intentional um, feature. For example, um, in April this year, the BRI portal, which is a website um, run by the BRI leading small group, um, said, the Chinese government has never limited the scope of BRI. It is not worth creating a list or a map of BRI countries. So from their point of view, this is clearly an active effort to encourage um, competition from entities seeking political support. Um, and as one example of how that has paid off, just uh, last week, uh, I saw a report of four different Chinese companies that have entered separate consortia to bid for a Tel Aviv uh, light rail um, tender. However, even if it's intentional, this is not a a problem-free approach. Um, as I've laid out, uh, these uh, football tournaments and chess events and so on are a distraction from BRI. Um, but that's not the most serious problem. That is the litany of projects afflicted by performance delays, public opposition, and national security concerns giving way to white elephants in Hapantota, um, and as Michael has laid out as well, uh, projects that have inspired um, a rightful concern from the US and others. So to conclude, um, I would say that bottom-up policy implementation through competitive appeasement is not unintended, and indeed there is a long track record of gray zone policymaking in China, but there are strong and negative externalities. Because of that, uh, China is currently attempting to reassert control over BRI. Those attempts include uh, the August 2018 Fifth Anniversary Symposium, which saw Xi Jinping uh, state that um, BRI must move from a broad sketch to, a, to filling in the details. Uh, other, other examples include the continuing build out of the leading group for BRI, as well as the unveiling of debt sustainability guidelines at the most recent uh, Belt and Road Forum earlier this year, under which, as a result of these guidelines, there is now a stronger regulatory framework guiding the reactions of Chinese and other companies to BRI. And lastly, um, just before the forum, there were reports from the National Reform and Development Commission by Bloomberg that they are attempting to develop a definition and a list of BRI projects. Of course, it is unclear whether this reassertion of control will succeed. One way we'll be able to tell that is if in the next few years we see more BRI football tournaments and fashion shows. Thank you. Thank you. I'm expecting some interesting questions about this presentation. That was very interesting. And thank you, Admiral. Uh, we're now going to hear about Chairman Xi's world-class Navy. Uh, thank you very much. Is this on? High tech. Uh, uh, I'm delighted to be here, and I thank very much uh, Jamestown uh, Foundation for inviting me to speak. Um, I'm retired from the Navy, but not from not from worrying about Asia. I'm currently a senior fellow at the Center for Naval Analysis, and most of what I know about China and the PLA Navy, I owe to the China team uh, there at CNA, uh, especially Tom Bickford and when he was there, Ken Allen. And I'm also currently a commissioner on the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. And this year, we had two very interesting hearings that bear uh, directly on what I'm going to talk about today. The first was 
a hearing on what keeps Chairman Xi up at night, and I commend that to your attention on our website, uscc.gov. Uh, and the second one had to do with talking about what does Chairman Xi mean when he describes the desire to, for the PLA to become a world-class military and implicitly for the Navy to become a world-class Navy. China's, it's become a, it's become a commonplace that uh, Xi is uh, China's most powerful, ambitious, and assertive leader in a generation. And he's advanced in an unapologetic vision of a bigger role for China in the world. And that, the PLA Navy has a major uh, place, I believe, in that vision. And secondly, the point I would make uh, preliminarily is uh, the, the maritime issues, and, and including the navies, are going to be a major facet of our broad systemic rivalry with China, a rivalry that I believe is here for the very long term. Now, if I can make this work. Ah. Whoops, wait a minute, I skipped a slide here. What does world class uh, mean uh, to uh, Chairman Xi? Um, he raised the issue in his commentary uh, in his three hour long speech at the uh, uh, 18th Party Congress in uh, 2017 when he said that the US or that the PLA should develop a world-class military uh, and he, we should get on with it. Now, we have no further information as to what she has in mind when he talks about what's world-class. You know, we, we all have our ideas, you know, without peer, uh, but what does is, what is world-class actually mean? Uh, we don't have as I say, any, any official uh, statements from the, the Chinese government, but we do have the Chinese commentariat who give us some unofficial hints here. Um, the ability to strength and strength to compete on par with world-class militaries, or the, the ability to deter force to match the militaries of world-class powers, or to compete with world-class powers, or compete with the world, world's strongest players. These are all the sorts of things that we hear from the Chinese commentariat, uh, some, some, you know, working in uh, at, at, at uh, Chinese war colleges and, and, and think tanks and what have you, uh, that suggest that in terms of the, the, the people, the experts in China, when they think about what does world class mean, it means the ability that China can match and deter the United States. Now, what these folks don't discuss publicly, that is, is what does it mean in terms of global PLA power projection? Or how and where would the PLA actually be used, except for UN peacekeeping and HADR uh, operations in peacetime? And what kind of global posture would the PLA associate with world class? They already have a pretty substantial base in Djibouti, and are they a lot of speculation that there are more to come? So is having a global base structure part of becoming world class? We don't know for sure. We can look at the evidence and draw our own conclusions, but we don't have uh, any particular authoritative statement from, uh, from, uh, from Xi or anybody uh, on the CMC. Quickly, uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on China's current strategy. I think it, this has been well known, but the, the last official statement was in 2015, the defense white paper that was entitled China's Military Strategy. And its emphasis, there was a huge emphasis on the maritime domain and that the main strategic direction of the strategy is east toward Taiwan and the Pacific. It has a forward defense concept. In other words, keep the United States, if, if, if the shooting starts, keep the United States at arm's length as far away as possible. We call it anti-axis and area denial. The anti-axis would be arm's length, keeping, keeping us away. And China's military strategy, such as it is, or what, that we know about it, is focused on East Asia. It's not focused on 
global issues. It's talking about Taiwan. It's talking about Chinese interest in the South China Sea and what have you. Now, the U.S. national defense strategy, uh, uh, I'm sorry I missed uh, Assistant Secretary Shriver, uh, and the Indo-Pacific strategy report say that China seeks regional hegemony. I think that's probably right. Um, but it, it also says China over the long term seeks global preeminence. I, I have yet to see anything that uh, you would, could suggest that that uh, is their uh, ultimate goal. But if DOD is right, China is going to need a world class Navy to do that. So since we don't know, once again, that's, that's a that's a that's a speculation and assumption from the Department of Defense about what that long-term ambition is. But if it is right, uh, then the Navy is going to put the PLA Navy is going to play a big role in that. So, what about today? Some realities. When when China sails out beyond the second island chain, or more put it in my terms, out from underneath the umbrella that it's land-based aircraft and missile def uh, ballistic missile and cruise missile provide for it, it becomes very, very vulnerable. It's alone and afraid out there in the Indian Ocean or uh, everywhere else without any air cover uh, and without uh, uh, much of anything else uh, except whatever, whatever they can build on their carrier air force. And so, uh, if when you think about where's China go, where's the China going, and where's the Navy going, its Navy going in the Indian Ocean, uh, when they operate there day in and day out, and they, as they have for the last ten years, they're operating where the Indian Air Force and the U.S. Fifth Fleet have air superiority, and so they're painfully aware of that. Uh, and uh, and so if one of their requirements, and I believe it is, is to eventually have the ability to deal, to protect their sea lanes, which cross the most vulnerable of which cross the Indian Ocean. How are they going to do that? How are they going to do that if, if, if the Indians are involved in a fight or if the, they're with the United States? So somehow they have to be able to bring air power, and it's not just sea-based or carrier-based, but land-based air power and missile uh, essentially an A2AD capability to the, at least the northern part of the Indian Ocean. And so I think that's something we have to keep an eye on. Are we going to see the PLA Air Force become more expeditionary in terms of bedding down fighters somewhere else around the world? You know, the U.S. Air Force has, has airplanes all over the world. So why should we suggest that the Chinese may not have the same ambitions? We don't know. But that's what I think we need to think about. The Belt and Road is obviously it's one of Xi's signature uh, objectives, and there's going to there are certainly facilities there that Chinese going to invest a lot of money in, and what have you that it's going to want to be able to protect. So the Navy is going to have besides sea lanes, they're also going to have to worry about Belt and Road infrastructure and all of that's associated with that. So there is a big lure drawing the PLA Navy toward the Indian Ocean. Big magnet, but they, in terms of peacetime, no problems in, peace, in times of wartime. How do you keep from being attacked by aircraft? So the final thing we need to know about the PLA Navy today is since 2005, they've built 105 blue water capable warships. I'm not talking about tugboats or minesweepers or uh, auxiliary, uh, hydrographic, I'm talking about aircraft carriers, destroyers, frigates, submarines, boilers, tankers to replenish it in a very substantial amphibious capability. And I'll mention that again. You know, there's a website up called Warship Porn. And what it is, it shows you pictures of ships. So I'm going to go into some warship porn now. There is, there is their, um, their first carrier, Liaoning, entering Hong Kong. I like this picture in particular, given the current circumstances in Hong Kong, because it occurred to me, looking at this as I was putting this briefing together, 
wow, you could, they could sail a couple of amphibs chock-a-block with uh, Chinese Marines right into Hong Kong Harbor right now. This is their new carrier. It's still on sea trials, the Shandong. Uh, it's been a long time in sea trials. I'm not sure if they're having problems or not, but it's, uh, it's still fitting out and what have you. But this is Chinese built from the keel up. This is the flying shark, the J-15, which is the fighter that is on the uh, carrier. Uh, and you'll see the, down in the corner, you can see the, green, the gr guys in their green helmets and t-shirts and orange and what have. They've copied, uh, Chinese have a, uh, copied the US flight deck jersey and color scheme uh, exactly. Um, and Unlike a catapult, where the, you know, you've seen Top Gun, where the guy whirls, goes like this, and the airplane launches on the catapult. Here he does that, but all that happens is those chocks holding the airplane drop, and then it goes at its own power off the key jump and launches, which means that when it is launched, uh, it w this is already a 33-ton airplane. It's very heavy, and when you put fuel and weapons on it, you have to be, it can't load it up with a lot of weapons because it's too heavy to launch. And so, and besides that, it, I guess it has, you know, landing on a carrier, you have to have a, a good car landing characteristics as you're coming in at low speed to, to uh, grab, the, grab the wire with your tail hook. They've had some problems with that. And I'm, I suspect that it has bad low power uh, uh, handling characteristics. So essentially, as the Chinese are building their aircraft carrier force, they're gonna have to reinvest in building an air wing of really capable airplanes. This is the one that's gotten all the headlines recently. This is the Type 55 DDG-101. It's big. It's a, the U.S. Navy's calling it a cruiser. Uh, it has a lot of firepower. Uh, it's 122 VLS to, uh, to cells. Three more fitting out and a lot of speculation about how many, uh, maybe 20, maybe more, who knows. The size of the Navy, the PLA Navy in the future is going to be determined by what the economy of China is doing. It's slowing down. Now, 6% growth is, looks pretty good to most people, but it's slow for China. So how, how much of, what's the, going to be the long-term impact on the PLA Navy, particularly the rapid pace of building ships that we've seen over the last 15 years, uh, if the economy continues to slow? So what? Well, the so what is, Today, China has the second most capable blue water fleet in the world in terms of, terms of modern warships. Now, I'm going to give you an eye chart that I doubt if anybody except those in the first row can, can see. But I'm comparing, if I can find my red dot here. This is the Chinese Navy. This is the British Navy, the French Navy, the Japanese Navy, the Indian Navy. Whoops. Uh, Russian Navy and US Navy. All the great navies of the world are up there. And I'm just counting blue water ships. I'm not counting, again, all the small stuff. But the numbers are impressive. 118, 37 for the Brits, 26 for the French, 44 for the Japanese, 33 for India, 70 for the Russians, and 230 for the United States. So they have the hardware to already put them very close to world class, right now, today. So one more thing on this, I want to show you an eye, eye chart. This is the peacetime naval balance today across the Taiwan Strait. And I'm just this is derived directly with a couple of ads from McDevitt, directly from the Department of Defense's annual report to Congress. Each year in that annual report, they have to do a military balance uh, across, of, of ships and airplanes and missiles and what have you across the uh, 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 Great. So what do we have here? This line is the most important in my mind, because this line adds up all the ships that can shoot you. They can shoot you with a cruise missile, they can shoot you with a torpedo or ships and submarine, air-launched uh, weapons and what have you. 
So China, on a day in and day out basis, has about 270 of these guys who can go shoot some at you. And 203 of them happen to be in the eastern and southern, the southern theaters opposite Taiwan. Taiwan has 72. The Seventh Fleet has between 19 and 27. And the Japanese have about 81. So just in sh ship firepower, we're Chinese have serious overmatch. And I'm not counting land-based aircraft or Chinese missiles. So what does all this mean? Now, China is on the way to a world-class Navy. There is no question about it. Uh, and let me get my talking point here. As I mentioned, huge firepower advantage. They're already number two in size, and with their new amphibious capability, the, L, uh, the new LHDs that they're building to go along with their uh, other big amphib ships, uh, they're, in a very short period of time, they're going to be able to do exactly what the U.S. Marine Corps does, put together a three-ship amphibious ready group with about 1,500 Chinese Marines on it and sail anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, and stay for as long as they want. Just like we do. Now, as I mentioned, their weaknesses uh, went away from Asia. And I want to thank Dennis Blasco, who I see lurking in the background there, uh, uh, for uh, uh, pointing out a number of these. They lack Xi Jinping and the CMC. They, they beat up on the PLA ruthlessly. Talk about peacetime disease and the five incapables and what have you. And, if you want to know about the five incapables, I'll do it during the Q&A. And the lack of combat experience. They lack air cover outside of East Asia. They have a, a pretty weak air wing for the carriers they already have. They have only six or seven, six, I think, F, uh, uh, nuclear powered attack submarines. But they can also, they've already taken conventional subs into the IO. And they have a limited base structure, but they're working on that. So the question already that everybody asks is, so. How big is the PLA Blue Water gonna, Navy going to be in 2035? We know how big the U.S. Navy is supposed to be in 2034 because the president said it should be 355 ships by 2034. So we know what the size of the Navy is going to be, what the plan is, and everybody's, myself included, is skeptical about getting to that number. But by math, I said, let's just, for argument's sake, say that China can build the same number of ships it has built for the last 15 years. Over the next 15 years. 2035 is only 15 years away, folks. That means they would have, when you look at it, the result would be, here's the magic number, somewhere around there. So, this number and mix of ships, I would say, is qualified as a regional world-class navy. And my analogy uh, would be the Imperial Japanese Navy on the eve of Pearl Harbor. They were, no question about it, the dominant navy in East Asia. No question about it. And I think that by 2035, there's every possibility, and there's a high probability that the PLA Navy will be the dominant navy in East Asia. I'm not sure that China wants to build a, a navy that could be operate in a predominant sort of a way globally. But I still think, uh, but I do think they're going to want to be able to make sure that they can protect their sea lanes in the Indian Ocean. So that's only half the globe, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. I think the Japanese only wanted half the globe. Um, I'm that's going right. to. There we go. Um, I'm going to avail myself of moderator's privilege. I have a question for each of our panelists and then open it up to the floor. Uh, and Admiral, since you're sort of on a roll here, maybe I could start with you. Um, I have the same question more or less for Dr. Green, and then I have a different one for Johan van de Ven. Um, Given the timeline, and given what you know, I want to throw into this mix the president of China, his ambitions, and the kinds of things that he talks about. 
and the possibility of a Pearl Harbor again, of a different kind, not a Pearl Harbor. But uh, what timeline are we then talking about? If you look at the current leader, if you look at his ambitions, if you look at what he's building, where does this go? And I guess I invite you to speculate here. Well, yeah, I, I didn't bring my crystal ball. Um, first of all, Chairman Xi, uh, I think his ambition, his main ambition, other than to have, be, have China having uh, be a global, recognized as a global superpower in 2049, is to make the, if you will, make the world safe uh, for the Chinese Communist Party. That, that it, it will be accepted. It will be politically accepted. There won't be people saying that China has to become a democratic country, which means finito for the party. And so uh, I think that's, that's his objective, number one. Now, I don't see a, I, I can't imagine a Chinese uh, Pearl Harbor, uh, an attack uh, a la a surprise attack uh, like Pearl Harbor. Uh, because the big difference is we both have a lot of nuclear weapons. Could I ask you to throw into that mix things like cyber developments? Well, that technology would, that, cert that, uh, certainly, uh, certainly they could, once again though, I'm just saying that, you know, uh, yes, they could, cyber could be, uh, he, we could, he could probably do, do severe damage to most of our satellite uh, infrastructure Conversely, we could do a lot of damage to their satellite. You know, their, their anti-ship ballistic missiles and a lot of their long-range stuff depends upon satellite navigation. So they're, they're creeping, they're increasing their vulnerability to uh, independency upon satellite surveillance as much as we have it. And so the point of it is, though, uh, even if you have a cyber attack and what have you, uh, as a I don't see it leading to general war because of nuclear weapons. I just believe that the possibility of it escalating to the use of nuclear weapons is such uh, that that will, that will stop people short of, of uh, pursuing actual serious force-on-force -force combat in East Asia. Now, the scary part about that is the Chinese talk a lot about the ability to fight a limited war in Asia which means, ipso facto, no escalation to nuclear weapons. So we need to make sure that the Chinese are as worried about nuclear escalation as we possibly are. They at least suggest that they aren't, but I think they are, but we don't know that for a fact. Thank you very much. And to our other Michael, um, could I throw into the mix for the biggest geopolitical globalism we can get here? Uh, the same question, but factoring in Russia, Iran, the collection of partners that China has been building. Um, again, I, I invite you to let the imagination. So um, history doesn't repeat. It rhymes. Um, I think uh, Mike McDevitt is right. The nuclear deterrent is an enormous um, uh, inhibitor to war and escalation. Um, but it, and I'm sure Mike would agree, but it's not, it's, it's not uh, foolproof. <laughs> and uh, so um, there are other uh, things that can, uh, that can, that can cause uh, a decision to go to war. And the, the Japan in 1941 precedent is not, is flawed in some, in some ways as an example, but there are some things that will make you think. When um, the Japanese cabinet met in November 1941, <laughs> Uh, on November 14th at 2 p.m., no. Um, uh, the, uh, one of the most important factors in their decision to attack was a belief that the Soviets would, would win, excuse me, that the, the Nazis would win, that they would take Moscow and then um, isolate and perhaps even take Britain. So, so that is a factor. The, the Japanese knew there was enormous risk, that although they had um, the largest navy, they knew that with, with industrial effort, the U.S. would quickly overwhelm them within, as Yamamoto said, in six months. And, um, but what turned the tide was a decision that the overall, overall global forces of history were against the U.S. and were four forces that aligned with Japan. So the Russia factor is important. Um, and just as important is how China evaluates U.S. alignment, uh, not only with Japan, which is trending quite well for us, but with Europe, with Korea, with Australia and India. Um, that would be 
inevitably part of the calculation for the Central Military Trade Commission. And we need to uh, be attentive to it in a way we were not in 1941. Um, the other useful thing to think about is in 1928, you know, Thomas Lamont, the head of J.P. Morgan, gave a speech declaring that war with Japan was impossible because of financial and economic interdependence. Um, and, uh, and then we had the Great Depression, Smoot Hawley, the collapse of the pound sterling. So, so you know, a, a, a collapse of global economic order, which would weaken the US, but would also drive nationalism in China, as it did in Germany and Japan in the interwar years, um, we might make nuclear weapons less of an effective deterrent. These are all, these are all wild cards. We can attend to some of these if we, uh, I worry, when I worry about China, I worry about the transatlantic relationship right now, because that's a global factor that will feed into Chinese calculations. Uh, in the 90s and in the 2000s, Chinese strategic thinkers talked about multipolarity, and they saw Europe as a pole that would counterbalance the US. Um, so we should be attentive to Europe as part of our China strategy in a way we're not. Um, similarly, pulling out of TPP and stepping away from shaping uh, regional and global trade order, it, we do at enormous risk to ourselves. Um, we didn't have nuclear weapons in 1941. Uh, we didn't have cyber either. So I think the point about cyber is important. We don't really understand um, how uh, deterrence works in cyberspace and how we prevent an escalation in cyber um, becoming an unintended escalation in space and therefore nuclear. So there's plenty to worry about, but there are plenty of, when you think about these areas, there are plenty of things, if we're attentive to them, like the transatlantic relationship, like trade, where we can actually reinforce the externalities that any Central Monetary Commission would have to consider when deciding whether or not to launch a war. It's not just about how many things we have that shoot, which are very important to be sure. <laughs> Thank you. And Johan, on uh, the Belt and Road, one of the things to be attentive to right now, I think. Um, could I ask you to consider just briefly or talk a little bit about the possibility that the fashion shows and the chess tournaments are not only window, but actually window dressing, that we still have Djibouti, what's going on in Cambodia, what's going on in Pakistan, this reach where there's a considerable discussion right now that these are actually military facilities in the making, as well as what's going on in the South Pacific now and so on. Um, again, just in brief. I think what I would say there is that um, it's not incompatible that BRI is bottom up and top down. And so um, these fashion shows and, and soccer tournaments and so on are attempts to seek political capital or wh whatever term you would want to use. Um, but this does not mean that BRI isn't also strategic. Um, and so I don't see any mutual exclusion between those those things, between between the soccer tournaments and between needing to take the threat um, posed by the buildup of PLA and Djibouti seriously. Um, and and um, also I'd add that um, as some scholars have mentioned, um, we're now in a second phase of BRI, which has called for more things like media cooperation, um, people to people exchanges and there's a I guess a danger within that um, paradigm of seeing um, or of, of normalizing what's happening um, so again like these are these are all happening they're not mutually exclusive and and none of this means that BRI isn't also strategic thank you all very much and now love delighted to open up the floor um, very happy to take your questions. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, the name is Garrett Vanderwees. I teach history of Taiwan at George Mason University. Um, Michael, you alluded uh, to the fact that uh, uh, Taiwan is losing allies in the Pacific. China is picking those off. The main interest Taiwan had was well, they wanted to have some development, agricultural development, and they wanted to have allies uh, speaking up for them in the United Nations. But now we see that those countries that have been picked up are being used by China to expand their strategic footprint. So how do we uh, convince our friends in particularly New Zealand and Australia 
that this is very much a changing strategic landscape or seascape for that matter. Um, so I think, so when I was in, I was the senior uh, Asia person in the NSC in the Bush administration, and we actually weighed in with Panama uh, quietly when they were debating whether or not to relations, and we told them the geopolitical consequences for the U.S. Uh, if uh, they switch. And I think the current administration has been doing that, uh, not, you know, as an adjunct of Taiwan's foreign policy, but because of these consequences. Um, the Australian uh, DFAT, the Australian or New Zealand governments would never have done this a decade ago, but I think now they might because they can see the consequences um, of, uh, of, 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 of Beijing reaching into the Pacific. And both Australia and New Zealand have stepped up, as they put it, to try to counter, uh, no, you know, predatory Chinese behavior. Um, and uh, that strategy involves um, uh, Official development assistance, which when you add up the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Japan is significantly higher than the money China's bringing to the table, even with BRI and, and things like that. Uh, and, it, and it includes uh, increased um, military, political military presence, which you see Australia, New Zealand, and the US uh, doing. But a really critical part of the strategy is um, reinforcing good governance, civil society, anti corruption, because uh, Beijing is going in and engaging with in what the Australian government calls elite capture, which means bribing <laughs> leaders in these countries with large casinos, pockets of money. Traditionally, Taiwan's counter to that has been to also bring bags of money. Um, but now uh, Taipei has an opportunity to align a lot more with the democracies, principally Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and the US, potentially India, France, which has interest in the Pacific to be the champions of civil society, governance, anti-corruption. That doesn't require necessarily government to government relations. It's something that NGOs can do together. For years, I've been encouraging friends in Taiwan to think about how to develop um, NGOs that are independent from the government, um, that are engaged in good governance, uh, that are engaged in women's empowerment, um, in the kind of um, tools that will help um, prevent um, this uh, elite capture. Because if you have a functioning press, a functioning civil society, functioning parliament, um, you're going to shine a light on this kind of corruption. Um, and so there's a real opportunity there for Taiwan. Uh, the new South Bend policy, in a quiet way, is beginning to move in that direction. But I think there's a lot more potential. But it's going to have to take a somewhat different tack from what uh, Taipei has traditionally done, which is, which is a kind of force-on-force competition with China using money. And it's and there the picture's even worse than the Navy <laughs> force on force picture for Taiwan. Um, so there's opportunity there. And there are um, increasing voices in Australia and New Zealand, I think, who would be sympathetic to that. Just to make the observation, I certainly hope Mike is right. Um, we all hope uh, Mike is right. I certainly hope that the administration uh, is now four square alerted to uh, renewing the Compact of Free Association with the uh, Federated States of Micronesia and, and Republic of Marshall Islands and Palau. Uh, it's important uh, that we keep them as compact states. It's important that we, uh, they, we have them as potential base, uh, bases. And more importantly, the compact uh, also uh, prohibits those states from making bases available to any third party. And so those are really important things. And certainly the Australians are taking the lead on in other South Pacific areas. But in terms of snatching Taiwan's diplomatic partners, um, uh, it, it, from all of the positive things Mike said, I just have this vague feeling that we're whistling past the graveyard on that particular one. <laughs> Palau is the country that I believe votes most often with us at the UN um, so far. Uh, yes, way in the back. Admiral uh, McDevitt, this is Glenn Howard, Jamestown Foundation. I had a question about, uh, I'm sure you've been noticing all these joint Chinese-Russian naval exercises that have been occurring in various places of the world uh, on Monday. Uh, it was just revealed that the, the Russians and the Chinese would be conducting a joint naval uh, operation uh, in South Africa. 
And if you look around the globe where they're doing these things, especially they did the exercises, uh, I believe it was in the East China Sea uh, recently, what, what do you think is going on? Do you think it's more, is there really something in it there from a naval perspective uh, of them trying to learn how to interact with each other or is it just thumbing their noses at us um, and trying to complicate our, our defensive thinking or we, I mean, what do you, where do you figure on this? Because there's some, certainly some interoperability issues I would think between the Russians and the Chinese, but uh, I, I, I'll leave it to you, you're the naval guy. Well, uh in the big picture, the, the 20 odd years uh, rapprochement between Moscow and Beijing in terms of um, uh, the closeness and, uh, and increasingly willing to say, sell the best and uh, in best in, uh, most capable combat systems that uh, the Russians can uh, devise is a cause for worry. And there is, in fact, uh, the more they exercise and get to know one another, obviously it it, it's, it follows that uh, that presumably their their ability to, to communicate with one another, interoperability, uh, their ability to come up with uh, with uh, procedures and techniques uh, that uh, allow them to do basic exercises together, all of those sorts of things are uh, are improving. So. Now, but then the next question is, would the Russians go, go to war in defense of China, or would the Chinese go to war in defense of the Russians? Uh, we don't, I, I'm skeptical about that at this stage. Um, so yes, it, 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 it's a, it certainly complicates our thinking and our planning and what have you. Now the issue on South Africa, uh, maybe many people know this, but it was a bit of a rev revelation to me to know that South Africa and China have been uh, very close, uh, have a very close relationship for many, many years. And in fact, it was China who fronted for South Africa to get them into the BRICS. You know, the, uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, uh, India, China, and South Africa. And so South Africa has big ambitions. They see themselves as being an entrepot uh, for Chinese trade going into the southern half of the uh, African continent. So the, the South Africans and the Chinese are thick as thieves. How about we take two more questions? Uh, yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Kazu Koyama. I have a question for Dr. Green. Uh, so Prime Minister Abe has called for a new a dawn of a uh, new a new era of uh, Sino-Japanese relations. Uh, and also, I believe they're uh, aiming to uh, conclude the uh, regional trade deal, the RCEP trade deal, uh, by the end of the year. Uh, do you think that uh, Japan in the future will, uh, because of their increasing dependence on the Chinese economy, will they be uh, acting more independently from the US? Do you think there will be a uh, increasing distancing uh, from the US in the future? Thank you. Didn't address that to me, would you? No, I'm, um, so, you know, um, uh, for people who have been drinking in Japanese bars, like Mike McDevitt, <laughs> um, you'll know that on a lot of Japanese bars, they have a sign outside that says, starting tomorrow, no drinking. <laughs> and uh, of course, it's there every time you go. To, and that's a little bit like the regional cooperative, uh, comprehensive economic partnership RCEP. I've been hearing RCEP will be signed by the end of the year for 10 years. Yes. And um, the U.S. has a secret weapon in RCEP, and it's called India. Um, and India and China are, as far as I can tell, still at loggerheads over some fundamental elements. So I, I'm not sure RCEP will pass. And even if RCEP does pass, Australia's in it, New Zealand's in it, uh, Korea and Japan are in it. It, it. If we were smart right now, we would see that um, as more of a stimulus than a threat because RCEP plus TPP would lead to significant uh, gains, hundreds of billions of dollars in economic activity. Um, and maybe it'll stir us up a bit to get more serious about trade in, in Asia. And I don't worry too much about Abe's um, outreach to Xi Jinping. Um, you know, for four years, she tried to isolate Abe uh, with foreign interference uh, inside Japan uh, by trying to isolate Abe in Washington, around the world, 
um, cutting off all uh, senior level meetings with uh, Kate Onren business leaders. Um, uh, Chinese ambassadors took up took out uh, editorials around the world attacking Abe. The best one was the Times of London uh, in around 2013 or 14 when the Chinese ambassador compared Abe to Lord Voldemort in Harry Potter. And I mean, it was an all out assault on Abe, an all out assault using classic United Front to isolate him inside Washington, inside Asia. Abe totally won that, completely won that. He didn't blink, he didn't give in to any of the Chinese demands, and eventually she kind of came around. So the question is, and you know, is is this happening because Japan needs China? It's, you know, is this happening because China needs Japan? And and the leverage cuts both ways. And at the end of the day, I actually see this as a rather um, positive development because as as Randy said during his comments, um, uh, Japan and Australia banned Huawei from their 5G market before we did. Um, Japan's 2013 national security strategy was premised on strategic cooperation on China four years, be- five years before we were doing that. So I think J- Japan under Abe has credibility on strategic competition, but is not stupid. Uh, Japan does invest more in China than the U.S. does or Europe. There are economic interdependencies. China, Japan does not want to put itself in the position with Southeast Asian countries or India of saying you have to choose. There's a little more nuance. <laughs> people, you know, five years ago, if you'd said that the U.S. should be as nuanced as Abe, people would have been surprised. But the fact is there's nuance to Abe's competition strategy, which, frankly, I hope we learn from. So the, the Japanese government, METI, has banned Huawei from 5G procurement, but they've not um, banned uh, trade. They've not. They don't haven't. Done, they haven't done what we did with the entities list, which is we can't execute that. It's 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 too much saying that companies cannot procure anything from Huawei. And so, in some ways, I think Tokyo under Abe has defined where the line is between cooperation and competition in ways we probably ought to be aligning to. Um, uh, now, if if we really continue dismantling our alliances and trade. Uh, somewhere down the road, maybe we should be worried about Japan moving closer to China. But I always tell my students, you know, the Japanese character for Emperor Tian, it's the only civilization in Asia that in the seventh century chose emperor just to show the Chinese that they were not under the imperial Chinese <laughs> system. And that is not going to change for the next 10 years or 100 years. Thank you. OK, uh, one more brief question. Yes, sir. So I'll make it brief. I won't comment on the, uh, I'm glad you brought up the Micronesia and all that. And I'd love to hear Mike Green say yap about another couple dozen times like he did last time he was here. <laughs> First time for everything, I guess. So this is uh, for Admiral McDevitt. You showed a lot of great equipment that they're making. Are they making the people to be able to effectively use and sell these things? Well, that's the million dollar question. Um, how good are they? Um, My yardstick is from a naval perspective, so I'm not going to talk about the Army or the Air Force, but for the last 10 years now, they've been able to take uh, two warships, an oiler, and now more recently, uh, periodically, a submarine, sail them halfway around the world, go to the far reaches of the Indian Ocean, uh, keep the ships operating uh, for a period of about four and a half months, and then when they're replaced, they take those ships and go two and a half to three months on uh, uh, port visits around East Africa, up West Africa, some in, throughout the Mediterranean basin, along the South Asian littoral, and what have you, and come back home for an a- annual deployment length of about 210 days, a seven-month uh, seven deployment, very similar to what the U.S. Navy has done. And they've been doing that repeatedly for 10 years. When you send out two destroyers and an oiler and send them halfway around the world and then send them around to Africa and what have you with no uh, uh, technical support. You don't have uh, shipyards waiting to repair broken things and what have you. And these ships haven't crapped out, to use a perf- uh, uh, technical term. Uh, and they, they are operating very well. And so in a peacetime what I conclude is their sailors have gotten pretty good at keeping those ships running. Now, what do we know about how good their combat systems are? Are their radars working? We don't know. You know, obviously when they turn them on, we'll know. But and will the weapons work when somebody says press the trigger or press the button and hope it go, launches? Uh, we know during exercises they, they go out and blaze away. They shoot like crazy for exercises, so they have no inhibitions about about uh, using ammo. 
uh, to increase proficiency. So, but they haven't had any combat experience. Um, they haven't uh, had any real joint. By the way, what the Russians and the Chinese, in U.S. terminology, that's a combined operation, not a joint operation. A joint operation is different services in the same country. But anyway, uh, so we, my, my view is what we don't know for sure is how the dual command with the political uh, commissar and uh, the uh, CEO of a ship, how they interact uh, when the chips are down, when you have to make a decision, like right now, uh, can they do it? When they, when they operate, when they, they go to Beijing to say, we have a situation, we recommend that we go chase off these pirates here. And if Beijing tells them, okay, you can do it, they do it, and they leave it up to the guy on the scene to execute. But they have to get a mother may I from Beijing before they do that. So uh, we don't know. Uh, I think they're probably, uh, would, if, if the shooting started, there'd be a degree of buck fever, everybody blazing away and not sure what the hell they're shooting at. Not unusual for any Navy. Um, they hadn't been in combat. I, I have to you do this because it, this is related. I mentioned the five in, in, incapables. Xi Jinping and the CMC are just willing to rip the lips off the PLA when it comes to talking about what they can't do. The five incapables are they cannot analyze the situation. They cannot understand higher echelon intent. They cannot make a decision on a course of action. They cannot deploy forces, and they cannot handle unexpected situations. So this is what the chairman, the commander-in-chief of the People's Liberation Army is telling them they cannot do. So he's, he obviously sees some things that need fixing. Thank you. I hope it takes him a long time. So that was and my hope, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for a terrific panel. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, the next panel begins at 3, so I say race out there and get your coffee. And thank you.